Tanks of compressed air strapped to his back. Man has a newfound ability to penetrate the four fifths of his world that consists of water. He does it for fun, for exploration, and for work. Dave Norfolk did it for work, for a career. He was an underwater maintenance man for 20 miles of submarine cable. Armed with a compact induction device, he checked his cable for wear and tear, for corrosion and decay. his death on the job. Dave died at the hands of two other men who had learned to live underwater and to kill underwater. There were no scars, no wounds to testify to what happened. They simply turned off the valve that delivered air to Dave Norfolk and watched him drown helpless. Then they turned the valve back on, knowing that when and if his body were found, He'd be just another scuba diver who'd met with a mysterious accident. There'd be nothing to indicate homicide. I didn't know Dave Norfolk or his killers. I didn't know that I was soon to face those killers myself. I learned about Dave Norfolk's disappearance a few days later from a man named Victor Halstaff, who looked me up at work. Halstaff was an official of the company which maintained the cable and employed Norfolk. Well, uh, this man, the man that was drowned, was he just doing a purely routine job? That's right. That's what makes it so hard for us to understand. He was just checking cable. Job he'd done before a dozen times. Was all this cable underwater? Yeah. Runs out from shore about 20 miles to Sea Rock Island. Service of the Radford Chemical Corporation. Oh, yeah, I've seen the plant from the water. That's the place that makes uh, chemicals out of uh, kelp and seawater, isn't it? That's right. The plant covers the entire island, so they have this special cable. Of course, eventually, that'll be replaced with the radio telephone. But until it is, we're going to have to send men down there from time to time to check that line. Well, that's a white sandy bottom out there. Visibility is very clear. And still, an experienced man like Norfolk was drowned. Now, before we send any more men into there, we want the entire area checked by somebody who knows what it's all about. Underwater. We'd like you to be that man. Well, I don't know exactly what you want me to look for. Neither do we. We'd like you to look. <laughs> I took the assignment because I'm interested in anything that concerns underwater safety. My first approach was to retrace Dave Norfolk's route the day he disappeared. I found the cable on the bottom and started to follow it, observing everything within viewing range. Something there might be the clue to his disappearance.
A giant bat ray was following the same course from the opposite direction. I stopped. It passed me by as I expected. I wondered if such an encounter might have frightened Dave Norfolk into panic. I couldn't know then that it was no native of the sea, but fellow human beings who had doomed him. Then a tiny piece of tape stirring in the current on the cable brought me to the beginning of an understanding of Norfolk's fate. It had been wrapped around the cable recently. Sea growth had been scraped away, leaving a bare spot in the insulation, and there were marks that looked as if they'd been made by a clamp. Someone had been tapping the cable at this point. Someone who didn't want to be discovered at it by Dave Norfolk. I surfaced immediately, found Hallstaff, and went with him to the Ratford chemical plant on Sea Rock Island. The president of the company might know who'd be interested in tapping his phone line. His credentials satisfy me, Mr. Hallstaff. Besides, I know of Mr. Nelson. Yes, Mr. Nelson, there is reason to tap our telephone cable, and a very important reason, too. It involves many, many millions of dollars and possibly lives. Then we may not be too far off. Is that right, Mr. Ludwig? Our company is conducting a very special research program on this island, developing a, a whole new group of chemicals, utilizing simple seawater. It has an enormous industrial importance and military importance. Until you walked into this room, we had every reason to believe that this was totally and completely top secret. When do you say this man died, the one who drowned? Last Friday, sometime around one o'clock by our closest estimate. Friday at one? Then this is worse than I thought. How so? Each Friday at one o'clock, it's automatic. Our executives assemble for it. We make a special call to our home office in the east. In that call, we provide for a complete verbal report on the week's progress, including everything that we don't care to put down on paper. In the past three weeks, our Friday conversations have contained information that is, well, is practically priceless. Has all of your important data been transmitted by now? No, there's more, including the breakdown analysis of our key seawater element. Well, they're undoubtedly aware of that. They'll be listening in again next Friday, you can be sure of that. We have a device that could warn us the instant a tap has been attached to the cable. Oh, that's great. Can you uh, get it connected by Friday? I think so. I will be there. We were there, Friday at one o'clock. Hallstaff and I on my boat idling along above the cable. Ludwig and a technician in his office manning the detection equipment. We had a radio channel open between us and a code worked out that we hoped wouldn't tip off anyone listening in. After one o'clock, you should have heard from him by now. Want to give him a buzz? Okay. Dolphin, this is Angler. Anything new? Over. What did I tell him? Nothing. Angler to Dolphin. We're underway, but we haven't sighted anything yet. Over. Over and out. We waited. When Hallstaff and I received the word that a tap was on, I was prepared to follow the route of the cable till we found another boat drifting above it. That one should be the diver's boat, and we'd have them red-handed. Better tell them to stand by. Angler to Dalton, we have a possible sighting. Over. Standing by.
The Zit. Hello, Dolphin. We have a positive sighting. A large school of tuna. Over. Roger, over and out. A large school of tuna. That was our code for a sure tap. We took off at full speed. Full speed wasn't fast enough, for it soon became apparent there was no other boat to find. We searched the empty horizon in vain. We had the entire sea to ourselves. Whoever was tapping that cable below us had reached it some other way. about in here, and I found that tap of the cable. I think we're going to take a look, huh? Good idea. Take over the wheel, will you? This time, when I reached the spot where last the cable had been tapped, I found nobody, nothing. The tapper or tappers were too smart to return to the same place. I wasn't able to find the divers who were tapping top secret telephone communications along an underwater cable. They were men who would kill rather than be discovered. There was nothing to do but return to shore and plan our next move, even while the wiretap continued somewhere out of sight below us. To find them now on a 20-mile stretch of ocean bottom was just about hopeless. Oh, it's obvious. They're not using a boat to get to the cable. But what are they using? I don't know. But I do know that the next time we go out, Vic, you're going to have to pinpoint the exact spot along that cable where they're working. Oh, now wait a minute. That's pretty rough. You've been able to tell me instantly when that tap has been applied. Now i got to know where so I can hit the water just above it. Think you can do that? Well, maybe we could. With an electronic echo device. Measure the modulations of the impulses from the point of the tap. We need some special computing. That'll use up some pretty precious minutes before we can get your boat bouncing. Well, next time, uh, I won't be using my boat. Next time, I was up in an Avalon Airlines amphibian, piloted by my friend Dick Talbot. Hal Staff, Ludwig, and the technician monitored the detection equipment. A flash from them, and I could be landed anywhere along that 20-mile stretch 
in a matter of minutes. Up there. Hello, Dolphin. Positive sighting at coordinates 117523. Computation may have been a little off, or Dick may have overshot his water landing, because when I found the cable, there were no divers in sight. But all they needed underwater was a couple of hundred yards between us, and I wouldn't be able to see them. I started following the cable, certain that they were nearby, and hoping that I was going in the right direction. Listening in all right with a device that I'd never seen before and recording the conversation on a tiny waterproof wire recorder. There were two of them to one of me. I knew now that they were the killers. I had to take them by surprise. well hidden by the grass, but I was afraid that my bubbles would give me away. I breathed as little and as slowly as I could. Luckily, the sound of their bubbles covered the sound of mine. man's air hose. That put him out of business fast and left me free to meet the second man on even terms. But the second diver didn't wait. He had more to gain by escaping than fighting it out down there with me. By the time I spotted him, he had an almost impossible head start on me. Still knowing that Dick on the surface would take care of the first man when he came up for air, I went after his buddy. I lost him completely for a time, but his direction was generally back towards Sea Rock Island, so I kept swimming that way and desperately hoped for a glimpse of him.
Finally, there he was, racing into a water tunnel of some kind that led from the Ratford plant. I knew how the divers had reached the cable without being discovered. They had come from the plant itself. The connecting shaft led straight up. There was light coming from above. This had to be the diver's route. The first thing that I was aware of when I came out of the water was the sound of turbines or generators nearby. That explained the water tunnel. I saw his tanks and diving equipment still dripping on the floor. Was out cold. He'd be out long enough for me to find a telephone and get Ludwig and the police down here. And once he and his buddy explained who they worked for and why, the Radford Company could go safely back to its top secret work. Sure that it was top secret. Hi, I'm Lloyd Bridges. Inviting you to join us for another action-packed story of underwater adventure one week from today. <laughs>